over the past few weeks, we have been we have been looking at this series titled The Lord God My Shield. We have been looking at a series titled The Lord God My Shield. Specifically in today's service, we are looking at put on the whole armor. The topic, the title of today's service is put on the whole armor. Put on the whole armor. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 14 to verse 18, it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fairy darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the element of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayers and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. There are many instances in the Bible where God said, don't worry, I'll take care of that. You don't have to fight in that battle. I, I mean, I, I, I'll take care of it. You just stand and be still and see the salvation of God in the land of the living. Vengeance is mine. Don't try and take vengeance on your enemy. Let me deal with it. I can do a better job at it than you can even begin to think. There are different places in the Bible where God is really in charge. Then there are a few dotted here and there where God gives you and I specific instruction concerning the battle that we're dealing with. And in this passage in Ephesians, he's not even asking us to fight in the battle. No, he's saying, Come as if you're going to fight. Come prepare. Come ready. Come with your full armor, with the whole armor, so that when the enemy sees you, he be the the message goes into its head that this is war. You and I, we have been called not to fight, but to come to the battlefield prepared, suited and booted, ready and equipped and protected. Preserved with the whole armor that God has brought, that God has given us, rather. But at the end of the day, you and I, we're just ringside spectators, just watching the master God at his at his at his best, doing what only him can do routing the enemy, defeating the enemy, and grounding them into dust on your behalf and on my behalf. See, when we talk about this type of, when we talk in this in this type of language of, of war and battle and all of that, it is easy for you to think we're talking of you coming with your boxing gloves or coming with your with your AK-45 and, and, and your bazooka and your tank and, and all of that. No. The battle we're talking about here is not physical. The battle we're talking about here is spiritual. It's invisible. It's not something that you, you throw point at. This battle is in the spirit realm. And because the battlefield and the battle itself is in the spirit realm, it's in the invisible realm, it's, it's, it, it is not something physical, you cannot fight it. You cannot begin to fight with physical arm armoring, with physical tactics, with physical approach. You also have to move into the environment, into the, into the area where the battle is happening and begin to fight in the spirit. So when God said, Put on the whole armor, He's not saying go to, to the to the to the um, military barracks and put on every gadget that you can 
You can lay your hands on. No, this is a spiritual battle. And God is equipped, has equipped us, has provided for us all that we need to preserve ourselves. And all we are doing, all he's asking us to do is don't leave your protective gears at home. Put them on. The contest is for the domination of your mind and your heart. The battle is for your spirit, is for your soul, and it's for your body. The battle that you and I will fight and we face every day. It's not like Russia invades, invading Ukraine. It's not like America going to Iraq. It's not like uh, this village fighting against that village. The battle that we are in, that we are engaged and involved in, in this instance, is a battle for the control of your soul, your spirit, and your body. And that is why it is not physical; it is spiritual. With that knowledge, therefore, that this battle is not uh, boxing gloves. It's not Tyson against Holyfield. This battle is spiritual. With that understanding, the challenge then is, who, which of these two warring parties would you align yourself with? Where would you cast your vote? In whose camp would you mark your attendance present? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, Whose camp you choose to belong to will determine what you face and how you go through the battle, but more importantly, how you come out and what you come out with at the end of the battle. Because the book of Romans chapter 6, in Romans 6 verse 16, it says, Do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves? whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness, whoever you yield to, whoever you surrender to, whichever camp you choose to belong to will determine ultimately the result of your life and my life. So the question I'm asking is this, where is your, where, which camp are you in this morning? Which camp have you chosen to be part of this one? But just in case you don't know where to go, just in case you're wondering which one is which, God is reminding us of what we need to do. He said, put on the whole armor of God. Not some of them. Not a few of them. This is not where you choose whether you want chocolate flavor or vanilla flavor, or you want caramel, or you want mint. No, it said put on the whole armor of God. Be fully clothed, be fully protected. Remember last week I was using the, the, uh, the coronavirus season as an example where all medical professionals, they are fully clothed in PPE personal protection equipment. Why? So that the virus don't transfer from the patient to the medical personnel. In the same way, in the same breath, you and I have been called by God to put on the full PPE. You can't say, well, I'm wearing the gown. I've got the head scarf, but I'm not going to wear the mask. Or I've got the mask, but I don't want to wear the gloves. No, you have to be fully covered and fully protected. Put on the whole armor of God this morning. Guard your waist with the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Step your feet into the shoes of evangelism so that you can spread the gospel to the uttermost part of the world. Grab hold of your shield of faith. Just in case any stray bullet is coming, you can just ward it off. Protect your head, it says. Protect your head, which is your mind, with the helmet of your salvation. 
Grab hold of your double-edged sword, which is the word of God, that is sharper than double-edged sword. And it cuts, divides, and slices the enemy into pieces. He said, pray always, consistently, without ceasing, especially in the spirit. Be watchful, be mindful, be alert, be vigilant and persevere to the end, then you will see the salvation of the Lord in the land of the living. This is the full array of everything that is included in the whole armor. And last week, last Sunday, we started dealing with this one by one. We looked at the first two, where you say, God, where we said, guard your waist with the belt of truth. And we also look at what is this breastplate of righteousness that you are required to, to put on. So this morning, we're going to go into the next one, which is the piece of armor to put on, which is your shoe of evangelism to spread the gospel. Evangelism, the purpose of evangelism and I've said this before, the purpose of evangelism, of evangelism in the body of Christ is not so that you can fill your church with people. It's not so that you can tick the box that you've done your social responsibility in that community. It's not so that you can brag that now you have another brand in another locality within the community. No, the, the purpose of, of, of evangelism is to share the gospel, to spread the good news, to let people know there is an alternative, there is a way out of the whatever situation they are in. And that way is Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. I know many people despise evangelism. Many people just can't stand the word evangelism. And then they, some people ask, how to, well, what has evangelism got to do with my protection? I'll tell you. You see, it is important for you and I to understand that the liberty, the freedom, the grace of, of, of salvation that we are enjoying and sometimes we have taken for granted today, it was given, it was purchased by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So it has come freely, but it took somebody to carry it on his back, to carry it on her back and bring it to your doorstep. I've said this before and the best repeating. I was born Muslim, full practicing Muslim. Then one day, traveling on a coach was an eight hours journey. Sat next to a lady, never known her, never met her, never seen her before. Half an hour into the journey, she said, she turned to me and said, excuse me, sir, can I talk to you for a few minutes? I said, yes, what is it about? She said, do you know Jesus? And I said, Jesus is Lord. What, why did I sit next to this lady? I've got seven and a half hours in front of me of this journey, and now she wants to talk to me about Jesus. Because as at that time, I, I don't want to, the word Jesus just, it just made me physically sick. And so I said, I'm not interested. So she said, okay. A few minutes later, she turned to me and said, sir, I just need five minutes of your time. I said, ma'am, I've told you, I'm not interested. About an hour later, she turned to me. She said, whether you want to hear it or not, I am still going to tell you. She never mentioned Jesus. Well, she only mentioned Jesus once in the whole conversation. All she said to me was, the same way 
the conclusion of 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 what she said was the same way people said the flood will not come in the time of Noah and only those who made it into the ark were saved is the same way those who are saying Jesus is not coming back there is no alternative to this life they will all perish and it's only those who made it into the kingdom of God that will be saved thank you for your time she never spoke to me again for the rest of the journey For the next three days, I wasn't myself. Everywhere I looked, it was like I could physically see the flood of Noah coming towards me. Everywhere I turned, I could see the flood almost physically, literally in front of me, the flood of Noah. Cut the long story short, I got back to my station. The following Sunday, I was the first in the church and I gave my life to Christ. What am I trying to say? Somebody had to share the gospel. If you have Jesus Christ, if you have proclaimed and declared that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, then it is imperative, it is incumbent upon you to obey his commandments. Because we've just read, it is to whom you yield yourself as slave to obey. It is him that would be in charge of your life and that would determine the outcome of your existence. If you say you are a child of God, if you say you belong to God, if you have declared that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, the, the shield, the shoe of evangelism is not an option. Because Jesus went and said in Mark chapter 16, oh glory, Mark chapter 16, from verse 15 to verse 16, Mark 16, 15 to 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. In the same breath, I can add to it, that those who believe and they go, they will be blessed. Those who be, does not believe and sit at home, they will have their own result as well. Mark 28, sorry, Matthew 28, verse 20, 19 to 20. In Matthew 28, verse 19 to verse 20, he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What more protection can you have than Jesus being with you all the way, every day, every time, even to the end of the age? But in case you're still wondering, how, what has that got to do with my protection? Simple. When you step out in obedience to his instruction and you deliver the task that he has given to you and that he has given to me, when we deliver maximally and completely on that, in fact, the moment you obey and you step out, it becomes his responsibility, not just to protect you, but also to provide for all your needs, to make sure you have nothing missing and nothing broken, to make sure you lack for nothing good. Why? Because the Bible says no soldier goes to war at his own expense. It is the responsibility of the government that is sending the soldier to care for his uniform, to protect him and give him the weapons that he will need, but more than that, to look after his family back at home. When you are a soldier in the army of God, you don't need to worry. Your protection is guaranteed. Your preservation is, is, is guaranteed. Your provision is guaranteed. Your well-being is guaranteed. Your spirit, soul, and body is protected. Why? Because you are his responsibility. But you need to put yourself in a place where that, that cover is over you. Many of the things that we pray for, many of the things that we, oh God, help, some of them are unnecessary. 
If you just do what God has told you to do, if you step out in faith, if you go out in obedience to him, if when you carry the gospel, you are untouchable. You are unmolested. Nobody can harass you. They may try. They may raid. They may do whatever they do. But like the Bible says, when the enemy comes like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise a standard against it. Why? Because you are carrying the good news. You know, every time I hear people in church talk about Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Matthew 6, 33, and it is only attributed or mostly attributed to the time of raising offering and all of that. And it just baffles me. One of the greatest secrets of the Bible is that passage. One of the mysteries of the, of the, the, the abundance of God is included in that passage. Unfortunately, we've reduced it to oh, bring your offering and pay your time. No. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 30 to 33. Matthew 6, 30 to 33 says, Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles say, for your heavenly Father knows that you are in need of all these things. That, that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Step out in faith. Go and do that evangelism. Share that little that you know with somebody. Maybe, oh, I don't know the first. No, the other person don't know the way it's written in the Bible either. The lady I spoke to earlier never quoted uh, James chapter this and Daniel chapter. No, she just told me the story. Even if that's all she knew, she told me that story and my life has not been been the same since then. Seek first. Seek first. Go after the purpose of God. Pursue the, the kingdom with everything you got and everything that others are running for and sacrificing their health, their sanity, their family and their everything. For. They'll just be added to you like sheep. Easily, quietly. What am I saying? Don't allow the worries of this life to stop or derail you from focusing on and laying hold of eternal purpose and of eternal significance. All the enemy needs to do is to shift your focus. Whatever you focus on, they say, will develop. Once your focus is moved away from the purpose of God, you are serving the, 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 an idol. When you are committed, when you are sold out for the purpose, to the purpose of God, for the purpose of his kingdom, when all that you sleep, eat, drink, and wake up is God and his kingdom, your weight your thoughts, your desires, your want, everything about you will begin to line up with every of his provision and every of his, of, of his, of, of his blessing. How do I know that? The Gospel of John tells us, John chapter 15 verse 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will Ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. So, go out today. Go out right now. Go out every day. Go out with a heart filled with the purpose of God, but with your feet soaked in the assignment of evangelism. You have received this grace of, of salvation 
freely, then give it freely for crying out loud. Continue to give it and give it and give it and give it to Christ. Come, do not stop, do not wait, don't get weary, don't get tired. Because as you do that, not only that you will enjoy the protection and the preservations and the provision of God, even the enemy will know that this one is firebrand. Don't go there. And you will be protected. Hallelujah. The next item on our, on our list of, of the armor of God, it says you must now take hold of your shield of faith. Take hold of your shield, the shield of faith. What does it say? It is not enough for you to have faith, to declare that you have faith, to say you are in the faith movement, to say you attend a faith-based church. Those are as good as they sound. That is not what we're talking about here. Your faith will be redundant and ineffective if you have not put it on as your shield. Your faith will be of no effect if all it is is, 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 a, is a decorative item in your living room. If all it is is just something that you pick and drop and choose and do whatever. No, 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 no. Have you seen a soldier a Roman soldier just leaving his shield anywhere and just gallivanting everywhere. As a soldier in the army of God, you cannot exist. In fact, you cannot live without your shield, which is your faith. As a righteousness of God in Christ, the prescribed way, the only way you are supposed to live and, 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 and thrive is by faith and is through faith. It is so important. God had to say in the Bible in four, at least four different places. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Romans, Romans chapter 1 from verse 16 to verse 17. Romans chapter 1 from verse 16 to verse 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. Galatians 3 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 3. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The just. The just. Those that have been justified by God, those that have been adopted into the kingdom of God, those that have asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, that is you and I, the only prescribed way for us to live is by faith. The only prescribed way for us to remain victorious is to carry the shield of faith everywhere we go. A few months ago, we did a whole series of faith, almost 10 parts. It's all on, on, on the YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it, not because it's just for crowd pulling, no, so that you can grab hold of this truth that we're talking about. If you notice in all these passages, it didn't say the just shall exist by faith. It didn't say the just shall eat and drink 
by faith. It didn't say the just shall go to work and buy the next car and by faith. No, it said the just shall live their life. The essence of their life is a function of faith. Faith is not a movement. Faith is not a doctrine. Faith is not a theory. Faith is not a sect. Faith is life itself. And any life that is lived outside of faith is not living, it's mere existing. Because the just shall live by faith. And that faith is your shield. It's uh, the shield with which you ward off, you, you, you quench the very darts of the enemy. Gloria Copeland said, or is it Joyce Meyer said, when fear knocks at your door, send faith to open the door. You would not find anything there. The battle is for your mind, it's for your heart, it's for your soul, it's for your spirit, your life, and your very existence. And the only way to live a victorious life is by faith. Your faith which, which is your shield, is a weapon that God has given to you. Faith is a total reliance on God and on his provision for your well-being. Your faith is the antidote to the tricks and the lies of the enemies. Your faith is your weapon for destruction. It's a weapon for you to destroy and eliminate the enemy completely and totally. Jesus said, I have, you have faith. By faith, you have, I have overcome this world. Your faith is the umbilical cord that ties you, that connects you to God through Jesus Christ. Your faith is your spiritual strategy to overcome the wiles and the tricks and the, the devices of the enemy. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemies. Take hold of your faith. Grab hold of that faith. Still talking about faith as your shield. In Hebrews 11, which is the hall, the, the, the hall of fame of faith giants, look at what it says about the shield of faith as an armor, as part of the, uh, the whole armor of God. He's, he's telling us, the whole of Hebrews was telling us the catalog, rather, the details of everybody that is anybody who, 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 who made exploit for God. And the only avenue they adopted with, to, to arrive at that is by faith. And then in Hebrews 11 from verse 33 to verse 35, he starts saying, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in the battle, Turn to fly the armies of the alien. Women receive their dead raised to life again. How? By faith. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. You couldn't even become born again without faith. You can believe all you want in your heart. If you are not saying it with your mouth, you're not saying it. You can say it till you blow in the face. If there's no faith in your heart, you are not going to become born again. You couldn't even be adopted into the kingdom and the family of God without faith. 
your shield of faith. There is nothing the enemy can bring. There is nothing the enemy can throw. There is no wild of devices of the enemy that can, that can overcome your faith. Because by faith, you've overcome them all. So when next, uh, next time the enemy sends his asthma of fear, his demons of worry and anxiety, his, his demon of panic attack, of sickness and of disease, of poverty and of lack, of, 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 of depression and, and anything else. All you need to do, all I have to do, all that is required of us is to just lift up our shield of faith and see all those arrows just being quenched by this shield of faith. Stop wasting your faith by warring against yourself. Well, I don't do that. Yes, you do. We, we all do. Stop wasting the power of your faith by using it against yourself. Because every time you worry, every time you complain, every time you come on rest, every time you become bitter, every time you harbor unforgiveness, you are using that faith against you. Only this time you are using it in a negative way. It is called fear. Oh, they're coming. Let them come. Oh, it's going to happen. And so, put your trust in him. Get hold of your shield of faith. And when I talk of faith, I'm not talking of your mental accent to say, yeah, I believe that's what you say. No. Faith, true faith in its fullness is a demonstration of what you say you believe. I'm sitting on this chair this morning because I believe this chair with its four tiny legs is able to carry my weight and support my frame. That is a demonstration of the faith I have in this chair and in its ability. What is your faith? What is the conviction and the manifestation and the demonstration of your faith in the God that you say you believe if you will not obey him? The next item on this list, the next item on this list, is list of the armor of God is to protect your head with the helmet of salvation. Protect your head with the helmet of salvation. What do I mean? Protect your mind. You see, while righteousness is your breastplate, and truth is your belt, and faith is your shield. The grace of salvation that you have and that you enjoy is the crown that is over your head, is the helmet that is protecting your head, which is your mind, from the attack of the enemy. Why faith resides in your heart, in your head, which is where your brain is, which is your mind. That is where your soul is, 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 is stationed. And the enemy is after your mind. Why? Because the enemy knows that it is in your mind that you choose, that you think, that you feel, that you make decisions, that you act out of. And if the enemy can corrode and, and, and corrupt your mind, all your choices, all your thoughts, all your actions, all your feelings, everything about you is, 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 is just functioning to serve the purpose of the enemy. But he's saying, put on that element of salvation so that you can protect that's your mind, that's your head from the attack and the infiltration of the enemy. Your mind is where your decisions are made. It is where you determine whether you want to follow 
the godly life or you want to just do like everybody else. Your mind is where you 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 came to your senses and realized there's a difference between living your life the way you are and living your life God's way. And then you made the decision to say, "Today, I'm I'm, I'm I take it. I made a U-turn. I'm going after God." That is where that decision was made in your mind. That is where this long distance journey. Of life. That is where it started from. But in order for you to maintain that conviction, in order for you to preserve that stamina, in order for you to go the long distance, you need to protect your mind. You need to protect your, 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 your soul by putting on the element of salvation. What do you mean by that, Sunday? By you constantly knowing, remembering, the reason why he lay hold of you by you constantly reminding yourself, training your mind to be focused on the fact that the old is gone. Now the new is here. The old story is not of me anymore. I am a new creation in God and I am going after my God with everything I've got. Your mind is where you begin to delete all those old habits, all those old ideas, all those foreign thoughts, all those negative feelings. You delete them from your mind so that your life can reflect the, the fullness of God. How do you do that? Replace the old, the corrupt, the devilish one with the new, the incorruptible, and the godly mindset according to Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to God which is your reasonable service how do you do that do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Wow, put on that element of salvation. Keep reminding yourself. Look back and see where he picked you up from and where he has brought you, but more importantly, where he's taking you. Don't let go of your first love for God. The enemy will attack your mind to make you question your newfound life in God. It will challenge your conviction of the grace of salvation. It will even compare your life in God with that of those who are not in God and supposedly are doing better than you and having more fun. But your helmet of salvation, which is your assurance of not just life here, in, here on earth, but even in eternity, the element will strengthen you. The element will fill you with the first love that you perceive from God when you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If you can protect your mind, if you can preserve your mind, if you can let your mind stay on God, he said he will keep you in perfect peace. No wonder, the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, from verse 1 to verse 3 says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first, at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Are you neglecting your salvation? Have you walked away from that your first love? Have you forgotten your first love for God that brought you into his kingdom in the first place? Has your passion for the kingdom, has it diminished this morning? Have you replaced 
replace your hunger and your thirst for God and for his kingdom? Have you replaced that now with routines and traditions of the church and of the meetings and church service and church this and is that what is it all about now? Your salvation. Your adoption into God's kingdom and into God's family is not something that you handle carelessly. Because if the enemy can discover a crack in your helmet, if enemy can just sniff out a crack in your understanding of what your salvation is and what the completed work of Jesus Christ, what it stands for in your life, if the enemy can sneak into a crack in that element, he will fulfill his mission to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But when you put on that shield, or sorry, when you put on that your element of salvation, when you are steadfast in your conviction of your salvation and in God who is giving it to you as a free gift, there is nothing the enemy can do that will touch you. The last item on the list of armor that we're looking at in today's service is the most offensive weapon in all of the armor of God, which is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. No wonder he said, grab hold of your double-edged sword. Grab hold of the word of God. Let the word of God be in your hand, in your mouth, in your heart, all the time, every time, and use it to dismantle the life of the enemy. Oh, this world is full of facts and information. We live in, they say, the information age or disinformation age or no information age or malinformation, whatever you call it. As good as they are, as wonderful as they may be today, Tomorrow, there will be a new information. There will be a new fact that will nullify the one you built your life upon yesterday. But there is something that cannot change. It's something that will last for eternity. That is something that even when the earth is passed away and the heaven is passed away, there is something that will stay forever. And that is the word of God, which is your double-edged sword. And guess what? That word is Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 to 3. Gospel of John chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 3 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. What is that? The word of God, which is your sword of the spirit. One of the ignorances of the church is its inability to understand and embrace the power that is contained in the word that we speak. Our inability to understand and comprehend and embrace and apply the inherent dynamic power that's in the word of God. When you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it. Because we don't know the purpose of the word of God and the word in our mouth. We daily, constantly abusing them. Your life and my life today are the product of the word that we spoke to ourselves and the ones that we believe yesterday. Well, you know, Tony, I didn't say it. I was just thinking it in my heart. It doesn't change because the word is a seed. And the only thing the seed knows to do is once it is planted, it starts to germinate. Then it grows into fullness. It brings bring forth its fruit and harvest is available, it's ready. Even God couldn't do anything until he opened his mouth and he spoke the word in Genesis chapter 1. When God created man, the first thing God did was to bless the man. How? The word of his mouth. In Genesis 1.28, 
One of the one of the most powerful prayers you can pray for anybody is Genesis 1 28. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over everything. That was God's blessing to you and I. Moses went to Pharaoh, the most powerful human being on the earth as at that time. He went to Pharaoh, not with bow and arrow or spear and javelin, the word. Let God's people go. Well, I wonder, he said, well, you will. And the rest, they say, sorry, the word. David went to Goliath while all the army of Israel were quaking in their boots. David went to Goliath and said to Goliath, you are a dead, dead, dead. You are so dead, they couldn't spell it enough in D-E-A-D. You are dead. The stone didn't kill Goliath. He was the the stone was just to let you know. I told you he's dead. Now you can see that he's dead. Jesus was coming out of the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and the enemy came to him. He didn't say, I will wrestle you to the ground. He just said it is written. The word, the word, your life will follow the direction of your mouth. So how are you using your mouth? Is it for your own benefit or are you using it against yourself? Because the book of Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it, they will eat its fruit. Are you using your mouth? Are you using the sword, the sword of the spirit, the word in your mouth? Are you using it for yourself or against yourself? Because the word in your mouth is sharp. Is strong, is direct, is powerful, is dynamic. Excuse me. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God, which is your, 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 your double edged sword. Your sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I wish we would just pay attention to the word that we say. I wish we would just understand the power that's in the word in our mouth and therefore know how to use it for us, for our own benefit. No wonder the book of Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Imagine if you just grapple of that understanding, how careful you will use your own word. The integrity of God is a function of the power and the accuracy and the precision and the perfection of his word. And guess what? We have the same word in our heart and in our mouth. The question is, will we use it? And if we will, how and for what purpose? Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will apply it by engaging the word and speak to this mountain, be moved, and it will not stay another minute. It will shift and go. What is that mountain that is facing you or stopping you that's in your path to victory this morning? Are you talking to that mountain or are you describing what that mountain looks like? How much of the word of God that comes out of your mouth that you even believe? Is that sword of the spirit in your hand? Is it working for you or is it working against you? Are you aiding or are you defeating the enemy by the word that you speak to yourself and about yourself? Because you are the most trusted person you know. And if you don't believe the word in your own mouth, no wonder you don't believe the word of God. Your armor, this armor is for spiritual battle. And there is nothing more spiritual. There is nothing more deadlier. There is nothing more powerful than the word 
of God in your mouth. And as you speak it, they are not just powerful. They are sharper than two edges sword. The whole armor of God has many parts, but they must all be adopted. They must all be appropriated. They must be put on completely to see the manifestations of the victory that God has already secured for you and I. So this morning or this afternoon, refuse to leave any one of this mountain, this armor aside. Refuse to leave any behind because all the enemy is looking for is a small window to gain access into your whole body so that it can steal, it can kill and destroy. But with the full armor of God, you are protected. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're in this service today, you don't know God. Just come to him now. Just come now. Say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you this afternoon. I don't know you, but I want to know you. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Wash me clean. Come into my heart right now to be my Lord and my Savior. And I promise you, I will follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me because now I know I'm a child of God. To him be all of the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen.